Ever wonder what is going on behind the scenes as the government investigates criminal cases? Are you interested in the strategies the government employs when bringing prosecutions? I'm your host, Greg Soferin, along with my colleagues in Hush Blackwell's White Collar Internal Investigations and Compliance Team. We will bring to bear over 200 years of experience inside the government to provide you and your business thought-provoking and topical legal analysis as we discuss some of the country's most interesting criminal cases and issues related to compliance and internal investigations. Welcome to the latest edition of the Justice Insiders. I'm your host, Greg Sofer, and lucky enough again to be joined by my colleague and partner here at Hush Blackwell, Eric Delea, who is the leader of our cybersecurity practice group and a partner in our Denver office. You can find his bio and background and in the show notes. We'll link to those uh, in the show notes. Eric, thanks for joining us. You bet. I'm glad to have moved into the repeat offender status to join <laughs> Second John. We're happy to have you here. So uh, you'll recall that the last time you were on, we had a, an episode, which I would recommend to our listeners, about the SEC's regulations uh, that they had put out, a fairly significant, robust, and strict requirement for prompt notifications for public companies regarding cyber attacks. And on the heels of that edict to the world, something happened to the SEC itself. And in, a, in what I would describe as something that's highly embarrassing to the agency, early this year, a hacker was able to hijack an SEC staffer's phone and apparently get access to the agency's ex, formerly Twitter account, and posted a tweet regarding a approval of Bitcoin exchange-traded products. And my understanding is it actually moved the market. So this was not some unknown, un, no one paid attention to sort of problem. In other words, the SEC, although it may not have been their own mainframe computers, if you will, got hacked after having told everybody that you'll get in trouble if you don't tell us right away when you get hacked. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and the fact that, and today's episode really is about this, that these uh, these data breaches and hacks of companies and turns out the government often have a human element. And so that's what, that's what I'm hoping to discuss with you today. You bet. No, I, I think it is a good example of it because there is a lot of inward focus that we see from the regulators and from um, consultants and private industry on protecting the network, having defense in depth, making sure nobody gets in. And unfortunately for the SEC, they've moved from the those that will category to the those that have category when it comes to dealing with an incident that they didn't want to have and a little bit of egg on their face. And in this case, it's a question that criminals are innovative and they are always looking for ways to penetrate a network and to get in through a form or a method that we didn't anticipate. Otherwise, we would have had a control in place. Yeah, so uh, some there's various different statistics about this, but at least one organization has, has reported that 82% of successful uh, data breaches are, can be attributed to some sort of human error. And I think humans probably constitute a vulnerability in most organizations for a variety of different reasons, but the more sophisticated uh, the hackers are, the easier it is to manipulate human beings. And we'll get into some of the ways that that's going on these days. But the bottom line is it is very interesting that all this money gets spent on sophisticated programs and and software and ways of hardening your system, hardware even. But if your human beings aren't properly trained and properly looking out for trouble, you might as well not waste your money on the rest of it, right? Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. And I'd echo those statistics as far as the anywhere between three quarters up to 80, 80 plus percent involving a human being involved in the exploitation. And once they're in, generally what we see are the more common types of threats that are exploited are credential theft, which is going to give that criminal the keys to unlock all the doors so that they aren't having to break in, they're just strolling. And if it's beyond that, it's also phishing attacks, or ironically, even though it gets a lot of the attention, especially for recent cyber events, vulnerabilities and exploitations of those, because they those generally take a bit more technical sophistication 
by the threat actor in order to take advantage of those. Once they become a bit more common, then those are moved to the ransomware as a service or malware as a surface market where they will sell or lease that code to a less sophisticated criminal for them to put to use for a couple hours to see what they can gain as far as quick exploitations, and then they move on to the next target. Yeah, and we can start with the credential hacks or the credential acquisitions, um, because I think what happened at the SEC here sort of falls into that category, right? Yeah, my understanding for it's you know was a SIM card swap or a subscriber identity module uh, swap of the employee's phone, but that was done through a you know by an email account being compromised that allowed the criminal to then get over to the wireless carrier to ask for the swap. And that puts the criminal into the shoes where they are able to bypass or see the multi-factor authentication, which we generally see as being the be-all and end-all and best, most common additional security control that's being used nowadays. And with that, they're able to simulate the employee and step in as if they were the authorized user. And I think something our listeners uh, should know also, and this is something that I regularly saw when I was in the government and still see, is that once your credentials or information has been stolen, not only do the hackers often do everything they can to exploit it, but as you pointed out, they then sell it and make it available on the dark web for anybody else to try to either do what they're doing or do something new. And it's amazing the community out there of people who are engaged in the regular course of business of trying to steal people's money and information. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is becoming a mature economic model or industry of criminal activity. So let's talk a little bit about this business email compromise concept and what the threat picture looks like. What should companies be and individuals be looking for and how might you train your folks to make sure that that vulnerability is controlled? Again, the the human aspect of this. I think probably the the most important tool for organizations to use would be rather than focusing exclusively on training, which we think of as far as a sort of a once a year, make everybody watch a video and we're taking time away from the revenue of the company because we're losing, you know, workforce hours and to focus on awareness and to have the InfoSec teams, the CIOs, HR, All of the folks that are interacting with the workforce, trying to find periodic ways to just keep the threats of fraud, whether it comes through the telephone, whether it comes through the email, whether it comes through a video screen, top of mind for the workforce. So posters in the elevator, signs by the coffee machines, ways that folks are going to be able to see it and just remember to be on the lookout for suspicious activity. And, you know, and here... uh... Our firm, I had this in the government also, um, one way to do that is to sort of, I don't want to say scare people, but there's nothing that reminds me more of the threat than when I get caught by our internal testing process. And it's, it did happen to me once. I, I was telling I was telling you before we started recording today that I thought you'd never catch me in, in a phishing attempt. Paranoid. I, for 30 years, I spent looking at the worst of human beings. I'm very careful about my internet practice, but I got caught by our firm's own internal sort of testing process because I was in a hurry one day. And, you know, I'm aware of it, but I wasn't disciplined enough to be thinking about it at that moment. And I click on a link that I shouldn't have clicked on. And and right then and there, I you know, you can expose your entire enterprise to the kind of trouble that the SEC had. You're, you're absolutely right. And that it's a good example in the sense that you can have a fabulous winning streak going until you until the misstep. And it only takes one. And that's true across the workforce. We see with the phishing testing metrics, they are a very good tool. And I'm not trying to disparage or downplay the value of them. But there are, you know, there oftentimes companies and regulators will think about it from a check in the block compliance mindset. Are you doing it? And if you are, okay, great. But if you really wanted to be innovative, sometimes the people setting up those testing tools can be a little too sneaky or they get blowback. It used to be a popular one that I would talk about using out here in Colorado to say on a Friday afternoon, you send the email out saying that I've got Broncos tickets for Sunday. You know, right now that may not be as popular or as hot of a topic as it would have been in years gone by, but 
for somebody that's in the Kansas City office, then yeah, if you've got make that email advertisement out there, you will see people because it's a first come, first serve, they're going to jump on it. The other aspect on recognizing those phishing emails is for a mobile workforce. Do they come across and do they look the same on your phone as they do on your desktop monitor? Sometimes that can be another way that people bite on it. And are the controls in place for an iOS you know, piece of hardware as opposed to a Windows platform? And do they come across and do you recognize them the same way? That's where I tend to see that I'm falling victim to it is when I'm looking on my phone, I tend to not have the same level of skepticism as I do when I'm sitting at my desk. Yeah. The other thing I think that is concerning and and particularly in the more sophisticated against larger hacks and, and breaches is once in the hackers and the bad guys, they don't necessarily do anything for a while, right? They're sitting there often watching. That's correct. You could think about it either as reconnaissance or pattern of life monitoring, to put it in DOD terminology, but looking to see how the organization behaves, who is involved in what types of transactions or projects. Meanwhile, the threat actor is looking to map out the network, find out where important information is, what are typically referred to as the crown jewels, and then figure out which communications threads they might be able to intercept and then use to exploit. What typically happens once those actions begin is rules will be added to employees' inboxes to try and redirect or delete and obfuscate alerts or other tips that the employees would receive. And then I've seen one example for a company that over the course of four months, There was back and forth between the threat actor and a procurement official. And they built up the aspect of the conversations and the discussions, seeded the ground with an aspect of, uh, we're probably going to be changing banks in a month or two. And then a month or two later, hey, here's the new wiring instructions. And then a month after that, hey, we haven't seen this invoice. Can you help get it taken care of for us? And once that money goes out the door, and the criminal act activities discovered, the organization says, okay, let's look at our insurance policies. The cyber insurance policy that they had may have been phenomenal. They may have $5 million of coverage, but the problem is there was no damage to the network or activity that was defined as a cyber attack. The BEC or that business email compromise activity generally falls under typical fraud. And In that case, their criminal liability coverage was only $10,000. So you have a mismatch between what's the value of the harm that can occur and through what method and the levels of protection that the company has bought for itself. Yeah, and that sort of goes to another level of diligence, which is you, you almost these days have to assume for some of these kinds of movements of money or movements of information that somebody else from the outside is watching. In other words, they could have gotten in through a lower level staffer, like what happened to the SEC, they're going to quickly turn their attention to the actions of the people who actually are moving money or information or whatever else it is, watch them, wait for that moment that you're describing. But those folks have got to be diligent about the conduct of their business as if somebody is watching, particularly for these last minute changes to the movement of whether it be data, information, or or cash. That's where the rubber often meets the road here, right? Yes. Uh, If you are dealing with scenarios where there are time-sensitive financial transitions, so whether it's M&A activity, whether it's closing on real real estate and other large events, everybody feels under the gun. And, you know, if it's anything like, you know, when when I've purchased homes or sold homes in the past, there's a flurry of activity right around the closing date. And people are looking to get the job done. So they're looking to be team players, but that's an opportunity that is ripe for a criminal to step in and abscond with the money. So what kind of advice do you give to organizations and individuals to to deal with that part of it? In other words, it's not just you're looking for the phishing, but you're also protecting your own activities and the movement of money during these high pressure times or times when somebody could take advantage of it at the last minute. I think some of the practice activities that senior leaders have to endure, and hopefully they do endure it. I mean, they should look at this as a way to assist with their risk management processes and controls. 
would be to schedule tabletop exercises where you get the senior leader group in and the general counsel or the CIO or the CTO have come up with a scenario. And I've run these exercises in some cases with clients where, I mean, you can game it out to a certain extent. You buy them lunch. So everybody's at least getting food while you make them suffer for 90 minutes or two hours and tell, you know, pick a card, any card. And out of that deck, there will be a typical ransomware scenario, which a lot of companies are familiar with now. But another one can be a business email compromise event. Or I think where we'll probably see activities shift to in 2024 or 25 is for larger companies where they have the risk of moving the market, a an AI deep fake on video. You imagine if you have a Fortune 100 company and suddenly onto social media, there is a fake video of the CEO talking about the company headed toward chapter 11, utterly fake and not affecting that company's networks or its data. But how would you get your communications team in place to deal with this? And what would they do in response to try and remediate the problem? So those exercises are not intended to give you a perfect answer to a given situation, but it's to allow the organization to get used to having to communicate across stakeholder lines and across business units so that when the real event happens, that will be a completely different fact pattern from what is practiced. They're used to getting the process going and talking. You know, the deep fake issue, I think, is particularly challenging because let's take the business email compromise situation. I know, for instance, law firms and real estate brokers and title companies have all moved towards a system where, where for instance, uh, you get on the telephone and confirm a wire transfer before anything leaves for, because so many of those transactions were targeted by scammers and hackers who were getting in between those transactions and having the last minute again change to their own accounts. But if the telephone call you make can go to somebody or you get a telephone call from someone whose voice has been deep faked or even get on a Zoom and you're staring at the CEO who's pounding on the table saying, you need to get this check out the door or, or transfer this money, wire this money tomorrow or our company's in trouble. You know, this is going to be make things much more difficult, right? Right. No, I, I think you're correct. And that's one of those aspects where brainstorming about it in a tabletop can allow a company to think about what processes or controls would they want to put in place before they're dealing with the time-sensitive project. So if they get to an aspect of and I like your approach and the recommendations on if you get the email about a financial transaction, switch over to a different communication platform and call. The reminder or the nuanced piece of it as the criminals get more sophisticated is don't call the phone number that's in that same email because that's the one that the criminal put in there that they're going to pick up an answer. You know, jump onto the web, find the main office and number for the company that you're involved with and drill down to get to the person through an independent means. So that can help to reduce the risk there. Another protocol or thought to consider, and again, this will be company-specific and risk-tolerance-specific for each organization, is if you've got financial transactions that hit certain thresholds, how many approvals do you need to have in the process to make it happen? You know, For some companies, a $1,000 Wire transfer might be a rounding error, and that may not require three or four people to stop what they're doing to approve it. But for a small business, it could be significant. And on the flip side, if you've got a $100,000 or $250,000 transaction, maybe that needs three signatures and involvements, and the CFO has always got to be involved with his digital signature on the email. You know, companies can game that out and figure out what's going to work for them, but it's far better to run that scenario in advance rather than after the fact. Yeah, you know, this, the idea, again, we're talking about vulnerability through human beings and how do you change human beings' behavior. To me, I think one of the things that's deficient in a lot of the trainings is to tell people you need to do this, 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 and this, but not give them the background of how the bad actors have succeeded in the past and how people have been actually scammed and tricked and how how they're able to circumnavigate, that is, the bad actors, the various protections that are put in place. Because I think unless you can almost see it from the, the other side, 
it's not real. And it makes you think that, you know, here I am, like you said, I've got to take this class. I got to check this box, but you don't realize that even a relatively low level or, you know, certainly not someone sitting in the C-suite can do something which drastically affects the, the company's bottom line. It could actually be a bet the company disaster. And if you give real world scenarios like the deep fake, like what happened here with the SEC, it springs at home a lot more. And I, a lot of the trainings I see don't do that. They speak about about the what you should do, not why you should do it, or how other people have been able to defeat it. And building on that point, companies that do try to tailor their training and their awareness programs to tangible examples, not only does it resonate with the employees, I have had conversations with regulators as we have been discussing a data breach disclosure for that company. And we have walked through how the intruder got in, how we discovered it, what we did in response, and then what we did afterwards, you know, I was pleased to have clients that have been able to say, we took this scenario from June of 2023 and put it into our October 2023 new fiscal year training schedule. And for some of the regulators for that industry sector, they're amazed. They think that's fabulous. I grew up in the military aviation community. We were always talking about accidents and mishaps that had happened recently what the root causes were, and what we can do to prevent them. That has, for the aviation industry, been a bedrock of how to develop a safety culture. And I think it works well for developing a security culture as well. Great point. How about the other human problem, which is an insider who's actually decided, so you, you can have all the training in the world, but if you have someone in your organization who's got a malign sort of mindset here, how much of a factor is that, and what kind of thoughts do you have about dealing with that problem? Insider threats continue to be a significant problem or a risk that companies need to think about managing, and in part because there are a variety of types of insider threats that you need to account for. You have the malicious insider, which is a disgruntled employee that has a bone to pick with the organization, or is they're getting ready to leave and they're going to go somewhere else and they want to take advantage of things for competitive reasons. You're going to have the negligent insider that literally just didn't pay attention to the training, doesn't believe in any of this stuff, has no idea why these things are a concern, is disengaged from work, and is just careless. And then you can have compromised users. And under a compromised user, I would encourage organizations to think about that as one of your employees that you have a duty of care to help and protect. They may be compromised because they're under financial stress. They may be exploited or leveraged you know, without even knowing it. Perhaps they had an innocent mistake of using the same passwords on three different accounts, one of which is personal. That's the one that gets compromised. But the attacker then looks at their social media account and then says, let me try the same username and password for the work account. And they get in that way. So trying to protect or encourage people to take those steps can go a long way toward addressing the problem. There are technological steps such as user behavior analytics that can be done to figure out, and, and this sounds conspiratorial or you know cloak and dagger, but the steps do work of, as far as figuring out when are people logging in? Are they doing it during normal business hours? Or do we have a couple of employees that are always logging in at 10 o'clock at night and downloading a lot of material? Those can be some of the cues. Updating privilege and access rights based on a person's job responsibility. Not that they're, and, and think about it both ways, promotions and demotions. As a person moves up the corporate ladder and gets into bigger roles, they may not need that admin access right that they used to have. And you can take and reduce your attack surface with some of those administrative and procedural steps. I mean, from my perspective, I look at it sort of the same way that companies should be dealing with whistleblowers is... If you know your workforce, if you are providing them with the right sort of cultural opportunities to let you know when there's a problem, this notion of signs and, you know, if you go around government buildings, all the signs talk about insider threats, you, you know, it's the rest of the workforce that's going to tell you that Jim's a problem. He's disgruntled. And I saw him in the office last night. He was green at, at two o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep and check my emails. 
that culture of reporting things and having an open way of communicating with your even your disgruntled employees so that they have an opportunity to talk to you, I think is extremely important in this context as well. Nope. You know, you're absolutely right. And coordination between the IT department, the HR departments to try and have those protective measures in place so that people know that they can get help and support if they need it, but also that the workforce as a whole understands that this is not intended to be big brother looking over the shoulder, but there is a benefit or a protection of the organization, protection of their employment, because you wouldn't want to have a bet the company or kill the company event as a result of someone else absconding with corporate data. Well, Eric, thank you very much. As usual, uh, your insights, valuable, very helpful, and uh, we appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, again, for folks who want to look at your bio, uh, we'll have it in the show notes. Happy to do it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for joining us on The Justice Insiders. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review The Justice Insiders. I'm your host, Greg Sofer, and until next time, be well.